comedian and activist Josh Burstein. Good morning, Summit. Hello, hello. Look at all these high achievers. Gold stars for all of you. Quick story. I cold called NASA once and sweet talked my way onto the first simulated moon based mission they had on an active volcano where I lived for two weeks with five European scientists as a guy who's never gotten better than to be in any high school science class. So showed you, Dad. I don't know what you'd miss most about living off planet, but for me, it was privacy, fresh fruit, Instagram, sex. I miss sex on Earth too. The point is <laughs> that uh, I went there to find out what is uniquely Earthling, what we can't take with us, because we're not going to NFT some giraffes. We're not going to have a Noah's Ark that Richard Branson's going to charter with beluga-sized spacesuits. So, our next keynote will take us face to face with lions, sharks, snakes. Oh my! The rarest creatures on the planet. The astonishing ones. The weird-looking ones. The really weird-looking ones. All the life that's worth protecting. He's a National Geographic explorer and Emmy-winning filmmaker that has truly gotten up close and personal with the wild side of life. So please, say hello to Philippe D'Andrade. Thank you, brother man. All right, how are we feeling today? My voice is gone because every time somebody comes up to me now, they howl. I don't know if that's self-induced, but I'll run with it. Thank you guys for coming, all of you. <laughs> so today we are going to go on an exploration across the ocean, our big, blue, beautiful planet. I'm going to take you guys to some of the most remote corners of our oceans. We're going to experience wildlife as I've experienced on the other side of my lens. And hopefully, hopefully, all I try and do with my images, all I try and do with my stories is light a little bit of a spark, a little bit of curiosity so that you guys will feel inspired to go and see these animals for yourselves. Are you ready to go? You guys ready? All right, let's start it off. We're gonna explore the oceans through the eyes of sharks. So I have made my name as a National Geographic explorer, photographer, and filmmaker by getting close to wildlife. I'm obsessed 
with getting close to wildlife. I need to be so close that I can smell what you're thinking. And still, it's not close enough. I need to explore every minute detail. I need to understand the intrinsic value of what makes an animal an animal because I see every single living being on this planet as worthy of having a story. And if I can help tell that story, then hopefully I can preserve what I love, that being wild animals more than anything on this planet. So in this image, I was able to get close to a lioness in Botswana as she heard her four cubs roaring with the distress of two male lions from a rival pride coming over, finding the den site. She relocated the four cubs, fought off the two male lions that each outweighed her by over a hundred pounds. And all she got was that little scratch above her eye. And as she was moving the fourth and final cub, I got out of the car, sat right next to the car, crouching down, and she just brushed my shoulder with the fourth cub and allowed me into her world to capture this image. I spent close to two months in Turks and Caicos filming bottlenose dolphins as the, the mothers were teaching the calves how to hunt. They do this very unique thing where they have to understand their sonar. So the mom will swim around in a circle, point down to a general area to tell the baby that there's food there, but it's up to the baby to hone in on its sonar, develop that skill that nature gave it so that it can make it into adulthood. And that's what the calf is doing right there, trying to pick up shells trying to look for razor fish but all it came up with with scraps and after again almost two months of building trust and trust and trust the mom finally kind of started to swim away from us and just give us the space to be able to work this is an olive ridley sea turtle in costa rica costa rica is home to two adibata beaches adibata is spanish for arrival it signifies the mass synchronization of sea turtles Hundreds of thousands of sea turtles come up to nest all at the same time. Why? This event dates back over a hundred million years. They evolved at the time of the dinosaurs, so they had to overwhelm their predators. And so by working with biologists, by acquiring permits, I was able to use a flash, just a flicker, less than a second to be able to capture the turtle as she was laying with the Milky Way dancing behind her. I mean, just for good measure, you gotta throw some cute things in there if you're gonna talk about sharks and lions. So sea otters, this is how I spent my birthday during COVID for no other reason than they're cute and I've never seen one before. This is my favorite animal on the planet. Whew. I did the wolf, my voice is going, but let me, let me try to do my best host way right now. <laughs> So that's, yeah, you give me a few days when I can recover and I promise it'll send some chill bumps up your spine. But this is a jaguar. They evolved from the saber-toothed tiger. They have the strongest bite force of any cat on the planet, around 2,000 pounds per square inch. They can crush the carapace of a sea turtle as they feed on them. Again, evolving from the saber-toothed tiger. The Mayans revere jaguars as gods, and I don't disagree with them. The image of this three-fingered sloth I took in my house when I moved to Costa Rica. This was in my backyard. I was sitting there having my first morning cup of coffee when I started to see the tree move, and it was a three-fingered sloth. I was able to get below it, and she was as curious in me as I was in her. Just because I'm paying rent, in Costa Rica does not mean I own my property. And the primates are quick to remind me of that. On this day, they were hunting on the beach by my house. They jumped down, started grabbing iguanas as they were sunning. And this young juvenile male turned around right to me, stared into the center of my being and took a bite out of this iguana's head as to remind me as to remind me who the most capable predators are. Not only are they better hunters, they also think they can do their job better than I can. So this is the first primate selfie. If they run it in the magazine, I don't know who gets the credit, but I'll let them have it. And with these animals, the reason I'm obsessed with photographing them is we can see the connectivity, we can see a window into our own soul because Every single emotion, every single vibrancy that they have inside of them reflects to our own being. They are so human-like because we as great apes 
came from the same forest hunt to the same exact animals and lived in a similar way that these animals do. And every single day when you can see a mother's struggle, a mother's worries and dependency from the baby onto her, you can start to draw the connective tissue from them to us. And when you feel the empathy, the emotions that they go through on a daily basis, you can again, do everything you can to preserve them. But ultimately, as much as I'm obsessed with land creatures, as much as the jaguar is my favorite animal, nothing, nothing gets me going like the ocean. The ocean is full of mystery, it's full of curiosity, it's full of exploration and stories waiting to be told. Literally, five minute walk from my house, I have tide pools along the ocean where you can see evolution at your doorstep every single day if you were to go out there. So this is of course a time lapse. So we take one second, we take one photo every two seconds, we speed it up and you can start to see the full display in front of you. But a little bit farther out, you can find Harlequin clown shrimp on a dive right outside of my house. This is a shrimp that fits in the palm of your hand and primarily feeds on starfish. Why? Because starfish regenerate their limbs, so the shrimp will feed on one limb at a time, moving the starfish around so that it can have a meal for about up to a month. This is a sea urchin. We as divers in our community refer to them as the devil's pubic hair because they have venom laced tips. If you've ever been on a dive and you've been pricked by one of these things, you know exactly why we call it that. You gotta pour some vinegar on it and then there's the little trump fish or the blennies. I'm obsessed with these creatures. They're less than an inch long and every single day you can kind of see them sift feeding. They just pop their heads out to grab any sort of meat or any sort of discard that's swimming by in the ocean. They're incredible creatures. I genuinely think a cartoon needs to be made out of one of these things. I don't know if there was a blenny in SpongeBob, but there should have been. If not, they need their own sitcom. So people always ask me, how do you know when you get too close? How do you know that you're too close to an animal or too close to a situation? Often nature will tell you. On this day in Mexico, I'm filming bait balls. Bait balls refer to the accumulation of bait fish like sardine and mackerel. You can see the pelicans diving down, the ball starts to split. That's a 60 foot fin whale blasting through the bait ball completely unannounced. I had no idea she was there. So after finding out that she was there, I gave her the respect that she deserved. I backed up and I was able to film this for the rest of the day from a distance and live to tell the story. So you would think that after you've been snuck up on once by a whale in the ocean, it would never happen again, right? Well, about Two, three months after that, I'm in French Polynesia. I'm swimming and dancing with this big, beautiful humpback whale right below me. When you ever feel like you have something looking over your shoulder, like a loud breather, another humpback whale completely approached me without me recognizing he was there. And the interest and the curiosity that whales look at you with is unlike anything I've ever experienced on the planet. Again, if you guys came to the opening talk, I talked about how Whales and cetaceans are the only animals that have a fourth lobe to the brain. We listen with our ears. They can also see with their ears. They get a digital image of what you are, every single cell in your body, when they look at you and they hit you with echolocation. And again, they look at you with more interest, more curiosity than you look at them with. So sharks, in my opinion, are evolutionary drivers. They are the reason that we are on this planet. They are the reason that we crawled out of the ocean, decided to breathe air, and then unlike our marine mammal cousins, cetaceans, who decided that life was better under the sea, we decided to stay up here. Thank God sharks didn't follow us, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. We'd be running away from sharks because they are the ultimate predators. Sharks as a family have over 500 different species. The last to evolve was the great hammerhead. They evolved around 80 million years ago. So as nature defined, they are perfectly engineered. She created the great hammerhead and said, okay, we're done. 
This animal can make a migration from South Africa all the way to Florida, and it can do that spanning decades and know exactly the route that it took to get here. And most of what you hear from sharks is that they're mindless man eaters. But when you start to speak shark language, as I know some of you do, you can get entirely close to them. You can have experiences with them that you walk away with completely changed. Even something like a tiger shark, which gets one of the worst reputations on the planet, you can give a little nose scratch to and redirect it if it decides to get too close. Right here in Bahamas is where I took most of these images. This is at a place called Tiger Beach, which is not too far away from here. If we were all insane the way some of us are, we'd be heading there right now to go on a dive. The Mako shark is the fastest shark in the ocean. It can swim at over 50 miles an hour. It's got a tail like a rudder that allows it to completely dash through the twilight zone looking for their favorite prey, tuna. And this, is my, this is my safe space. This is my office. This is what I get to experience almost daily when I'm in the water with sharks. You've got nurse sharks, you've got Caribbean reefs, you've got lemons, but the one I'm interested in most, can you see that big fella in the middle right there? That's the tiger shark. So whenever you're doing a shark tango, you gotta keep your eye on the prize. You're always looking for a specific species because sharks are ambush predators. They are the ultimate opportunists. You don't wanna have a shark coming at your back. You always wanna keep eye contact because predators treat predators like predators and they treat prey like prey. And the number one deterrent, if anybody here is considering getting in the water with a shark for the first time, I can tell you for certain the number one thing you have to do when you see a shark and you want to let it know that it's getting close enough is make eye contact. Why? Because they are used to things moving away from them. They're used to things turning their back to them to find a hiding space. So if you lock eyes with the shark, you're letting that shark know, I'm a predator, I'm here, I'm capable, and we're here to share the same liquid space and they'll treat you with the respect that you give them. So even when you're moving the boat anchor, this is what it looks like. It's uh, sometimes I have to like look at these images and remind myself that it's not that normal, but it's normal in our world. But at the end of the day, what's normal? So we're gonna jump to a few different locations that I feel like are some critical elements in shark preservation and how we can change our relationships with these animals. The first being Cocos Island. Cocos Island was the inspiration for Treasure Island. Remember in Jurassic Park when they're heading out and they're doing the helicopter scenes and they're going off to that island to explore the dinosaurs? All that was filmed in Cocos Island. It's about 600 kilometers away from the mainland in Costa Rica, and it's one of the most beautiful places to experience sharks on our planet. Waterfalls fall from the sky. This is a cloud forest, it's a rainforest in the middle of nowhere. Pirates used to use it because it's one of the most remote freshwater spots in the ocean. And so there's carvings from the 1800s. Jacques Cousteau put his name there. He even put his stamp of approval of calling Cocos Island the most beautiful island on our planet. And an animals like the white terns, the angel terns, the Espiritu Santos, they go there to have their babies. It's crazy to see a bird of paradise like this with a flying fish because since the island has no known predators, the only predator is a lizard. They can feel free to have their babies. They lay the egg right on a branch edge. It hatches and then the mothers and fathers come back to feed the baby right on the tree's edge. So it's wild when you see a remote island and then you go and you see a flying fish in a turn in the middle of nowhere. And this area is protected by dedicated conservationists. These conservationists every single day are pulling up long lines that are set about 12 to 20 miles off the island. What the fishermen do is they're hunting there illegally. So they set long lines just outside the park boundaries. The currents take them into the park boundaries and they fish the most 
plentiful waters on our planet, but because of the rangers, like I just showed in that previous image, they pull up the long lines, they cut the lines, and the bridge that they made to get from one side of the river to the next was completely made from confiscated Chinese and Taiwanese fishing lines in buoys. And you can really see how nature is abundant, but also how it can heal itself. The jungle, I promise you, living in the jungle, the jungle takes over. If you give it time, nature will heal itself. So you can completely see it start to restore and feed itself again. And this image I truly believe is one of the most powerful I've ever captured in Cocos because this buoy that was used to kill these animals, the jungle has decided that it's gonna do what the jungle does in take over. The most passionate person I've ever come across in Cocos Island is Randall Ladaus. Randall is a absolute living legend. In my opinion, he is the Jane Goodall of sharks. He's the Michael Jordan of the ocean. He is one of the most unsung heroes. He has dedicated his life to preserving Cocos for decades. And this is what they're doing out there. They capture sharks, they tag them, and then they release them. And it's a tricky job. You don't always walk away with all of your fingers. Now, this wasn't from a shark accident. Our Captain Mora, he's lost it in commercial fishing, not shark tagging. So goes kind of too par for the course that he would lose his finger extracting these animals versus now what he's doing, which is preserving them. But it might look a little bit intense, but when you tag a shark, what you have to do sometimes is you have to pull the shark up onto the back of the vessel you have it for about five, six minutes max. You wanna cover the eyes of the shark because it gets it into a calm state. And then you can start to perform the surgery. So here's Randall covering the eyes. This is Dr. Mauricio Hoyas. He is the expert in the world on great white sharks. So the reason that we ingest tags is because they perform exquisitely better than satellite tags, which go on the dorsal fin the dorsal fin tags sometimes fall off. The idea with the dorsal fin tag is that every time they surface or get close enough to the surface, they'll send a ping so then you can get the data from that. But when you ingest the tag, you can have buoys at the bottom of the ocean that transmit a signal, receive a signal, and then send it back to our computers. They're a lot more dependable technology. The old school way, again, is you have to swim with sharks, you have to have a spear, you have to get over them, and you have to prick them with that tag. So this is a GoPro that I fixed on one of the biologist's heads. You can see him swimming, looking for a scalloped hammerhead. And those that are daring and wanna pay a fee and wanna make a donation can go out to Cocos Island and help tag these sharks. You can contribute to science and you can experience the ocean as they've been for millions of years, which is plentiful, which is bountiful. And so the reason I named this talk Worth More Alive is because we have to start putting a value to these animals. Obviously, we in this room believe that they should exist because of their intrinsic and biological value. However, there's a lot of people making a lot of money destroying nature, killing animals. So we should be making money preserving these animals because if we can justify their means economically, then we can preserve them into the future. So Cocos Island, as an example of worth more alive, they value each shark at over 300,000 because of the ecotourism opportunities that they bring and the scientific value that they bring. All the permits goes towards paying the rangers salaries, goes towards making sure that there's enforcement, there's no police out there. The rangers are the ones who are enforcing this area. So through ecotourism, through scientific permits, you can actually preserve these animals. And one of the reasons I went out to Cocos Island was to film a very specific behavior. I learned from my idol, Sylvia Earle, that I was at National Geographic headquarters and I go, Sylvia, I'm going to Cocos for the first time. And she's like, make sure if you see boobies in the water, the camera's rolling. And I'm like, I'm not going to Cabo, I'm going to Cocos. And she's like, no, not those boobies. I'm talking about white-footed boobies. So white-footed boobies are these beautiful birds where 
when tiger sharks and Galapagos sharks see them nesting on the cliff's edge, the sharks will swim up to the side of the cliff and they'll tail whip water onto the birds that are nesting, knock them into the water and then come and feed on them. So we were swimming, we were filming sharks when all of a sudden we see boobies in the water and this is evolution right in front of you. We think that we're gonna get a predatory behavior here with these animals. It's a little bit gruesome to film predation. It's not everything Nat Geo makes it out to be. When this young booby decided to crawl on the back of my friend's shoulder, and look, it's looking down using that nictating membrane, and then it got so comfortable that it fell asleep on my friend's shoulder. So we have a rule that we don't interact, we don't get in the way, we don't judge, nature is nature, she's gonna do her thing. However, in this case, we decided to put the booby back because when you, over the course of 45 minutes swimming in the ocean, we're in this together, the booby's looking at Chris like, yo, if you go, I go, if we go, like that's our story. And so I was able to capture a couple of images. This is Manuelita in the background with the booby that fell asleep on Chris's shoulder. It truly shows like in Jurassic Park, like Jeff Goldblum said, nature finds a way. So this booby lived that day and I'd like to think that she's still terrorizing fish out in Cocos Island. We didn't get the boobies getting fed on in the water. So what we ultimately decided to do was switch our attention to white tip reef sharks hunting at night. In order to capture this behavior, you have to get into the open ocean at night surrounded by sharks. So this is when sharks come alive is at nighttime. All their tools are completely on display. The only way to properly capture this, you go in, you have one or two dive buddies because you don't wanna cause a commotion, you flick the light on, and then after the sharks are deterred by the sounds and, and the vibrations of you getting in the water, they get comfortable and then they start to come back. They literally go from dormant, comfortable, calm animals during the day to ravenous wolves at night. So all the fish have to find a feeding, a hiding spot because the sharks have this very incredible technique. They have these sensory organs littered across their face called ampullae of Lorenzini. Ampullae of Lorenzini are sensory organs that allow sharks to detect heartbeat. The vibrations of your heart when you get scared, when you get excited and it starts to palpitate, that's what causes the sharks to go into a feeding frenzy. So once the sharks scare a fish out of its hiding spot, it's like the dinner bell completely going off. Everything becomes excited, everything gets intense, and that's when you have to lock in, you have to really slip into the zone of survival mode because you've got sharks going in between your legs, you've got sharks all around you, and you really see this predatory display on behavior that's been happening for over 450 million years. So this is what it looks like when you're overhead, when you're surrounded by sharks and you're just trying to get the shot, you've got to depend on people all around you. So this is an image of a shark kind of creeping onto a puffer fish. They won't go after puffer fish because the puffer fish will expand and they have some venom inside of them so the sharks know better than to eat them. But this behavior is why it's important to keep sharks around. Sharks have a very important role. They remove the dying, the dead, and the dumb. They are evolutionary drivers. They have these lateral lines on their sides, much like a cat's whiskers that allow them to detect elemental changes. They can feel when something around them is different. They are nature's ultimate hunters. They make us better. They make everything around them better by being alpha, by being the keystone species, by being the top predator. They force evolution. They are evolutionary drivers to their core around 450 million years. Again, they've outlived the dinosaurs. Nature has decided these are our vacuum cleaners, and if you're not gonna decide to get better, sharks are gonna make you better. That's the way our oceans were shaped. And the ultimate predator is the great white. This image I took in Mexico off Guadalupe Island, where in Mexico is one of the most incredible places to see sharks. You can see great white sharks, tiger sharks, and again, one of my favorite animals on the planet, the mako sharks that can swim at over 50 miles an hour. They have conical noses. They replace their teeth endlessly. They have these giant black pelagic eyes which allow them to dive 
deep into the twilight zone, which is between 300 and 800 meters to chase their favorite prey, the yellowfin tuna. And this is what their tails look like. This is why they can reach speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. Mexico is nature's buffet. Every single day when I showed you guys the video of the bait ball, this is what you can see. Common dolphins going after sardine, going after mackerel. And the way that we find the bait ball and the way that fishermen reports used to respond of the seas boiling, that was because so many birds were diving into the water and so many predators were jumping up from the ocean that from a distance, it literally looks like the ocean is smoking. When you see this from miles away, you see a trail of birds and you see an eruption on the sea floor that's when you know that you have a bait ball and you can start to see the common dolphins pointing you in the right direction. And when you jump in, this is what it looks like. If you're not careful and if you're not swimming fast enough in a bait ball, then the fish start to come to you. They surround you because they're using you to deter themselves from the other predators. And the reason bait balls happen is because there's a plankton bloom around the full moon. So the full moon triggers a plankton eruption that comes to the surface and then that's what attracts all the other predators and one of the keystone species in that so i'm going to pause it on this frame right quick and show you guys this because i don't know if we made a discover accidentally on this shot but you guys can see the striped mar marlin on the bottom correct and then you see that fish on the top does anybody know what that is so that is mahi mahi or dorado what we believe we discovered accidentally is that these fish, which I'm sure everybody's had a mahi sandwich, these fish are camouflaging themselves as the marlin. You see those stripes? Once we leave here, Google an image, Google mahi mahi or dorado. That fish does not look like that, yet through its skin, it's camouflaging as this predator to pretend like it's this predator so that it doesn't get eaten while it's partaking in the festival. So you can see why the Marlins evolved the way that they did. You can see that it uses that sword on the front of its face to stab a fish. And then what they'll do, they'll swim down, they'll shake the fish off of their sword, break it in half, and then they'll come around to eat it. And of course, this is filmed in super slow motion. But when you're getting these shots, when you're in front of these animals that are swimming around 40, 50 miles an hour, there's sea lions, there's sharks, there's striped marlins, you absolutely have to be on alert. The last season I was there last year, three people got stabbed by marlin alone. One woman jumped in, got a marlin through the foot. Another guy was photographing, didn't see the action behind him and got one in the back. It's absolutely critically important that when you enter the ocean, that when you go to document things like this, you're respectful and you're aware of what you're getting yourself into because nature writes the rules in the ocean. And again, if you're careful, if you adhere to her warnings, you can sit back and you can capture everything on full display. This is the fin whale going back to that scene that I showed you before. You can see all those scales raining down after a bait ball. And then you can see just how giant, just how perfect this animal is as she lines up on the bait ball. So the very interesting thing about cetaceans, again, with that fourth lobe to the brain, the ability to see sound is what they're doing. They are lining up on the absolute center of the bait ball. They won't open their mouths unless if there's a reason to open their mouths. So unless if they feel like they're going to ingest enough fish and they're going to take enough of a bite, they physically will not open their mouths because otherwise they have to filter out the water through their teeth and it's just too much effort to do. So the reason that all these behaviors happen are because of sharks. They're keeping the bait ball towards the top. They're hunting from the surf, from the bottom of the seafloor vertical. The tuna are pushing the bait balls up along with the sharks. And then that allows the birds to dive down. That holds the bait ball in one place. And then it allows the shark, the whales to come over and to feed. So every single predator plays a role in these plankton blooms and then in these bait balls, but it's the sharks that keep the bait balls towards the surface of the water that allows everything else to feed. 
And of course, when you jump in and you see the majesty of nature on full display, and then the very next day you go out with locals and you see sharks doing all this incredible predatory behavior and then hanging from a long line, it really, really stabs you in the gut. Because when you see something perform at its peak and then you see it on the other side of the line, it's the most unnatural feeling in the world. So in this image, <clears throat> I took this shot at a cartel fishing ran community. There's six different sharks in this image, four of which are critically endangered. So clearly I didn't gain permission. I didn't ask to be there. So what I did was I found this village where they were, I knew they were long lining the sharks, which is where the previous image came from. I put up my drone and I started to fly it over where they were drying out the fins, which will eventually make their way into parts of Asia. The reason we're killing over a hundred million sharks a year is because of shark fin soup. It's a delicacy in certain countries and it doesn't even have flavor, they have to add chicken broth to the soup to give it any sort of flavor. The fins themselves only create texture. So when we stop the buying, when we stop the demand, we can stop the killing. So a lot of different parts in Asia are really starting to restructure their mind. People in higher class societies are starting to move away from shark fin soup as a delicacy. And this is leading to an overall appreciation of these animals. But until that completely happens, images like this are gonna carry on. And the reason this is important is because it's both human and animal suffering. The people that live in this dirt town village, they go to the bathroom in a plastic bag, they throw it in the desert. If they're lucky, they get $25 a day for their work and their kids clearly do not have a sustainable future because out of the six species, if four of them are critically endangered, what chance do these animals have and what chance do their kids have? And so at the end of the day, this is all one fisherman took away. So what's happening here, and this is a story worth more live that I did for National Geographic, we started to look into the shark fin trade. And what we realized is that the fishermen, they're no longer making enough money through the shark fin trade, that they're starting to harvest the meat. And the meat is the highest concentration of mercury on the planet, over 4,000 times what the USDA regulates as safe to consume especially with pelagic predators like blue sharks, makos, and great whites. So you're literally poisoning yourself every single time you eat shark. And what's even worse is because the animal is so large, the fishermen started selling the sharks to schools because they can make money. So they're physically poisoning their kids through this catch. And what's even worse is Walmart in Mexico is relabeling this meat as a fish that's safe and that's legal to sell. So they're capturing the fins, they're taking the meat, they're selling it to schools, they're selling it to Walmart, and Walmart is relabeling the fins. So again, it's human and animal suffering. We're poisoning ourselves when we eat shark, we're poisoning our generations, and we're poisoning the ocean. Because after a day's catch, the beaches are completely washed up with bycatch. This is a scalloped hammerhead that is maybe a year to two years old. So we're killing them at a rate where they're not replenishing themselves. There's nine species of hammerheads on the planet and all nine are endangered or critically endangered. And every single day when you swim up or when you drive the boat up to the beach line, you can see them harvesting cow nose rays, mobula rays, and these are animals that once were completely abundant and are now down to endangered and protected species. When you jump in, this is what the oceans should look like, not washed up beach lines from neonites that will never have a chance to make it into adulthood. And when you give nature again a chance to rebound and you give it a chance to be abundant, you can see multiple species of predators in the ocean. This is what a bait ball looks like at the surface with the tuna driving them up. This is how our oceans should look like, not in the previous images. And I don't always put humans <clears throat> in my images, but for context, I do. So there's a very important project happening in Mexico right now in Mag Bay, and it's that 
which is driven out by Marvivo. They're taking the local fishermen and they're changing them into ecotourism guides and they're creating sustainable solutions. So they're harvesting these chocolate clams as we refer to them, these giant clams. The locals have an investment in the agriculture. So they're not only making money daily by harvesting these things, but they're also having stocks, they're having bonds, they're having say in how this is carried out, and they're creating sustainable solutions for their children. And so Marvivo is a project that I collaborate with. And this project is an over $80 million carbon credit project in this area. I know there's a lot of controversy and a lot of say around carbon credits, whether they actually work or not. There's a couple of great projects, this being one of them, because I physically firsthand have seen how it's changed the community going from harvesting sharks to preserving sharks and doing sustainable agriculture in the ocean. And when you do this, they opened up a restaurant recently. You can go swimming with sharks. You can see the operation. You can get a mezcal margarita. You can get clams that were harvested by the family of the shark captain that you just went out with. And this is a much more sustainable economy around preserving sharks. So it's not always happening in foreign places like Mexico and Costa Rica and far off lands. One of the places that really needs to get on board with preserving sharks is right in our own backyard. Where did we leave from? Port of Miami, right? Can anybody guess this skyline? Port of Miami. So as of less than three years ago, we discovered a great hammerhead nursery right off of Biscayne Bay. So collaborating with the field school out of University of Miami, this is Dr. Catherine. She's the lead biologist of the University of Miami Shark Lab. We bring the sharks up. The PVC pipe acts as them breathing. They, to, they have to oxygenate by swimming. So when they're on the surface, we do that. We replicate that by putting a tube in their mouth and pumping water through their gills so that they can breathe, take some DNA, tag them, and release them bonnethead sharks, scalloped hammerheads, and then this beautiful animal is one that we saw in Florida, and then one that we saw right here in Bimini. This image was taken right here in Bimini. Every single January, February, and March, if you wanna see some of the most beautiful animals on the planet, you can come swimming with these animals. It only costs you about $300 a day, but it's one of the most incredible experiences you can have on our planet. And so when the sharks in Bimini are not having fishing lines, not having long lines, not having entanglements, almost always when you dive in Florida, this is what they look like. There's a very complete contrast of the culture of sharks from Florida to Bahamas. Florida sharks always have sport fishing lines, lines in their eyes. We're always pulling entanglement off of them. And a lot of times what happens is the fishermen can't even be bothered to remove the lines properly. So they just rip the lines out or they hit the sharks with baseball bats to get their lines and hooks back, breaking the jaws of the sharks. So almost every single shark you'll see in Florida looks like this. And we're even selling critically endangered Mako sharks. We are hunting and killing these animals to the point of extinction. Again, critically endangered. I went to a fishing tournament, a kill tournament in New Jersey and in Maryland where the legal catch size was around 86 inches. They didn't catch a single adult. And so they dropped the legal catch size down to 72. We are knowingly fishing these animals to extinction and now we're making it easier to do so. So this is what you can see at a grocery store versus seeing them alive. And again, the culture of preserving these animals in Bahamas has rewarded them handsomely. A single great hammerhead in its lifetime of ecotourism can generate over $10 million. Bahamas makes over $115 million annually from shark diving alone. You can only get about 300 to $500 for a great hammerhead set of fins on the black market. 
So when you see them from below, remember when I talked about those ampullae of Lorenzini? Those are those sensory organs right there. And you can see how clean, how beautiful, how majestic, and how nature intended for these animals to be seen in Bahamas versus the sharks that you see in Florida. The seagrass bed that we've recently discovered on a project, I have a National Geographic grant with Beneath the Waves. We discovered the largest seagrass territory on the planet thanks to tiger sharks. The tiger sharks that we tagged showed us that all the way from Bahamas over to Southeast Asia, there's a seagrass bed, which the oceans are responsible for half of the world's oxygen. So by preserving sharks, we preserve seagrass bed because we're preserving their prey, we're preserving clean air for ourselves. Eight billion people a day depend on the oceans as a food source, and again, we rely on the ocean for half of our world's oxygen. So when it comes to food, when it comes to clean air, we need the ocean. And what does the ocean need? Sharks. Thanks to tiger sharks, we've made this discovery, and thanks to tiger sharks, we're preserving seagrass beds. So the Bahamas, I couldn't endorse it more through ecotourism. If you guys wanna have a world-class, incredible, safe, renowned shark dive experience and see these animals firsthand, you can jump into blue holes. This is the place to do it. When I got my grant with Beneath the Waves over in the Bahamas, we got in uh, submarines and we discovered a nursery site for these tiger sharks in the twilight zone around 400 meters. We went down in subs to be able to film them. We put cameras on the backs of tiger sharks and even filmed them mating. This was the first time that's ever been done in history. It was in like black and white footage, so it wasn't degraded as an aired. However, it's important to understand these behaviors if we're gonna preserve these animals. Another NGO that's really worth checking out right here in Bimini, I always have to shout out the locals, is Sharks for Kids. This is Dr. Jillian. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is... I got 10 minutes, I can hold out. So this is Dr. Jillian. She takes the locals out to see these animals and she's completely rewired the way that they see them. And I asked one of the guides, I was like, does this really work? Like coming here as a kid, does this really change your affinity? Does this really change the way you feel about these animals? And the guide looked at me and said, I did this six years ago as a student and now I'm taking you out to see these animals. Does it work? It worked for me. So there's that saying in conservation, you protect what you love and you love what you understand. So as long as we can start to rewire the way we feel about the most misunderstood animals on our planet, if we can get out there, if we can light a spark, and if we can endorse ourselves and other people to just jump in, take the plunge, and take a chance on rewiring the way we feel about nature, we can start a love language and we can start to preserve these animals. And in doing so, we can preserve ourselves because we greatly depend on the oceans. So again, the name of my organization is called Worth More Alive. If you guys want to get involved, we're looking for teachers, we're looking for conservationists, we're looking for biologists, we're looking for people that care and that are willing to put a economical and environmental assessment on sharks in a way that we can preserve our oceans and we can preserve our own futures. So I made this short video because I believe it's a testament to what you can achieve when you take a group of school kids out to see the ocean for the first time like we did in Costa Rica. I think that everybody can make a difference. We all have a role to play and our actions help shape the world around us. Once I started seeing the effects that we're having on our planet, the more it made me want to be a part of the solution. I first came to Costa Rica in 2017 with my best friend Brian Magari. We were here to film a wildlife series for National Geographic. 
once the series ended, we went back to the States, but always talked about how we had basically just scraped the surface with Costa Rica and how we wanted to have more of a direct effect for the animals that we filmed and how we could inspire the next generation of Costa Ricans to protect their natural world. So after brainstorming, we developed a plan. We wanted to get a base in Costa Rica and start developing a conservation curriculum and use the media that we're continuing to collect to add to the visual elements for the books and lesson plans. The idea felt overwhelming, but we were compelled to try. So we packed all of our gear and returned to Costa Rica with a new purpose. Our first week back, we took a group of local students to go spinner dolphin and humpback whale watching. This is one of the few places in the world where you're almost guaranteed to see both in one day. People from all over come here to see these animals, so it was a shock to learn that the students were yet to experience this. I'll never forget, when that first whale breached the surface, those kids lost their minds. This is where it all begins. Filmmaking started off as just a passion, but over the years, it's evolved into a responsibility. The reason we're documenting wildlife and their ecosystems now is to educate and inspire the next generation to protect nature. Because this is our home. This is where it all begins. We only have one. And so there's two main reasons. There's two main reasons why in my life I'm so compelled to do the work that I do and I'm so motivated to dedicate my life for wildlife. Number one, specifically with the ocean, I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I lived there until I was almost eight years old. And the first time I went surfing, I was six years old and I was with my cousins, I was with my father, and we were out in the water, and I was on the break. I'll never forget, this is the first memory, the first and only memory I have of the oceans as a child. I was on the surfboard with my cousin, and I got trapped underneath the wave, I fell off, and I just started to tumble, I started to roll, I came up, and I was, I mean, I was six, I was crying, I was completely like, you know, that was, I thought my world was gonna end at that point, and I'll never forget, and my father wasn't a kind person. I grew up with a single mother and you know she did an incredible job raising us. And so I was with him that day and I remember him holding me underwater at six years old and telling me literally like I'm not, he said to me in Portuguese, he said, I'm not gonna raise a girl. And he said, if you're not comfortable, if you're not confident, like get it. And so that instilled a fear in me of the oceans that literally, from when I was six years old until I was 25 years old, I didn't go back in the ocean. I was deathly afraid of the ocean from that moment. And so when I got the opportunity to take my first assignment for National Geographic on the ocean on sharks, I completely ran with it because I wanted to rewrite my narrative, my relationship with fear and my relationship with the ocean. And it jump started an infatuation and a love language with our beautiful planet, our blue planet, in a way that I've never felt about anything else in my life. So when you have a fear and you lean into it and you challenge it, you get to be the narrator, you get to be the author of what the next chapters of your life look like. Rewiring your fear in relationship with something that used to scare you on the other side can be passion and purpose. And the other thing, growing up as an immigrant in the United States, I felt not that I didn't have a voice, but that people weren't listening. And so when I looked at animals, we always say the same thing about animals. They don't have a voice, they don't have a voice. I disagree with that statement because they do have a voice, it's just that we're not listening. Just because we can't speak a language of something that we don't understand, doesn't mean that they don't have a voice and that they're not worthy to chip that voice in. So I always look at animals as the sole Thing that saved me in my life, that gave me purpose, and that gave me a connective tissue with our planet in a way that 
nature I felt understood me, was my healing mechanism, was my therapy, was my counselor, was my best friend. And so I feel indebted. I feel completely obligated to do the best job that I can to preserve wildlife because it preserved me. And so that's why with Worth More Alive, we are creating an environmental education curriculum. I'm trying to implement those same rules, regulations, inspirations, and, and values into the next generation of Costa Ricans, because I believe that as a child, if you have the infectious healing power of nature, you can carry that forward in life. No matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're struggling with, you can always go to nature, you can sit with your thoughts, you can examine the world around you from a complete organic way and you can find the answers in yourself. All the superpowers that animals have, all the abilities and capabilities that wildlife inhabits, we have inside of us. And it's not about letting the wild in, it's about letting the wild out. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Don't come.